smell good. Um, glad to have you all here with us today, and I uh, appreciate everybody joining us here from JCCS. Um, I know we have a lot of things going on right now. As Renee said, it's a very busy time, um, as we are dealing with many issues and many things going on in the district and in your schools, and I know it's difficult to get away and uh, to take a couple of administrators and other folks to get away from the school for a day, um, but I think the work that we are doing today is that important. Um, and what that I've really dug into and seen over the past few months since we've experienced some difficult times uh, has led me to believe that this is imperative um, and something that we have to do to support our students. I also want to welcome all our guests uh, that have joined us from throughout the state. We put a call out to districts across the state to join us um, because as you will hear today, this is not just a JCPS issue. This is statewide. Uh, this is nation. And the data is alarming right now. It is um, a crisis situation. Uh, that is not just a JCPS issue. It is all of us across this state and across this nation. Uh, but we have the ability to control what goes on here in JCPS and build systems and structures in place to support students and for all of us across the state to join arms together um, and work together to support all of our students. You've heard me say often, JCPS folks, about the importance of school culture and how important culture is to success in a school. And there's a lot of research to support that, that culture, that a positive school culture is one of the most important factors and aspects of student achievement and success. And so there's a lot of things out there about what does school culture mean. And, you know, I've kind of created my own because there's only so many things that we can control. A lot of things happen outside of our control, outside of the school walls that we cannot control. But what I usually indicate to be a positive culture is the collective beliefs, attitudes, and actions of the adults at the school and how those beliefs impact student success. So think about that. That's what we have, the collective actions, beliefs, and attitudes of the adults in the building and how that impacts students. And most importantly is ensuring those beliefs, attitudes, and actions provide supports for our students. And that's what we can control. We can control the attitudes and belief and actions of the adults in the building. As many of you know, when I speak to uh, groups around this community, I usually ask them to suspend their uh, beliefs about what is a good school and a bad school. We hear that all the time throughout this nation, good school, bad school. And I often say, I think a great school is a school where the adults come together collectively in order to provide the supports that students need. And there are examples of great schools throughout this community who might not be considered high achieving schools that do incredible things for our students. And that's what we have to make sure that we do and continuously work towards is that we provide those supports for our students in a systemic way. And that's what we're going to ask you today. We do know our students are coming to us across this nation and in JCPS experiencing more need, more trauma on a regular basis. That is something that you all face every single day and you know. Here are some stats on some of the trauma that students face. It's estimated that 26% of children witness or experience trauma before they turn four years old. More than one in four. That before they come to you in school for kindergarten, they've already experienced trauma. Nearly one in four students who attend public schools have experienced a traumatic event. Research shows that trauma can have adverse effects on memory, language, emotional and brain develop, which can interfere with mastery and acquisition of new skills. And most alarming, increased in early trauma in, child, in a child can also be associated with impulse control, poor attention, difficulty regulating emotions, self harming and aggression. And so we have all of these factors that we have to deal with and many more with our students. And so it has come to a time where we have to provide more supports and systemic supports than ever before. And everyone knows in recent months we've experienced tragedy here in JCPS. And so suicide and trauma and bullying are not um, always linked together. 
but they do have a relationship that we have to acknowledge. And our story around tragedy is no different than many throughout this state and nation. And I have talked to superintendents throughout this state who have experienced the same uh, tragedies that we have in recent months. And so I want you to think about these numbers. When I see these numbers as we begin to dig into this work and plan this summit, it's extremely alarming. Youth suicide has increased by 70% in the past decade without a clear explanation. Think about that, an increase of 70%. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among students age 10 to 24. Second leading cause. I think this is one that alarmed me more than any. 30% estimates are that 30% of all high school students have contemplated suicide. Now think about that. Of all your students, high school principals that are in the room, 30% have contemplated suicide. And four out of five teens who attempted suicides have given clear warnings to friends or adults. And so this is alarming data. And I think it's clear from this that we have a crisis nationwide on our hand, on our hands. It's also very evident that suicide is now increased from ages 10 to 15. And so we have to take action. We know our district has faced this heartache, but we know the time to act is now. And that's why we're here today at this summit. And I do believe this. We have to look at doing things differently because we, this crisis is now upon us and we have to consider doing things different systemically. We cannot continue to do the same things that we have done. And so today you're gonna to hear from experts around this issues with bullying and suicide. We know those two aren't directly linked all the time, but we do wanna make sure that in all of our schools we provide the supports that our students need, that they feel a sense of student belonging and be successful. So I'm gonna challenge you today. It would be easy just to sit here, hear the speakers, go back and continue to do the same things. But as we often focus on school culture, I'm gonna ask you to think about the systems in your school, the supports that you provide students. Think transformationally, how can we do things differently as a school? So we can provide many things as a district and we are gonna to continue to increase our supports throughout this district. You all know that we have added mental health practitioners for every single school in this district at a cost of about $11 million. But that's how important this is for our students so that they can be successful. So we are gonna to continue to increase those supports from a district level, but I will challenge you at the school level, what systems do you have in place? Take the information that you hear today, get with your leadership teams back at the school and think about transformationally, how can we do things different to support all of our children to create systems in place where that will happen. At the conclusion of this summit, I'm gonna have a call to action for all of us. The information that you hear today and that you begin to put plans together, we must walk away from here with a call to action about doing things differently to support our students. And obviously we say this all the time, but if our work today can save one life of a student in JCPS and throughout the state, it is well worth our time to be here. So challenge you today, think differently, think transformationally, and think how we can support our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Our first keynote speaker today is John Akers. John Akers has served as the executive director of the Kentucky Center for School Safety since his appointment in December of 2000. He has 48 years of experience in public education and has received awards and recognitions that include Administrator of the Year, as well as Outstanding Teacher Award, Distinguished Ed Educator, and the 1998 High School Principal of the Year awarded by the Kentucky Department of Education. Since 1999, John has served as the Kentucky Leadership Academy coach, mentoring 40 principals, and the Scholastic Auditor for KDE. He is also a national trainer of emergency management 
for the United States Department of Education. Please welcome our first keynote speaker of the day, Mr. John Akers. Very importantly, I live in Lexington, Kentucky, and I wear red and black. Go Cards. I take a lot of hell up there, I'll tell you that. My boy played for the Cards back in the early 90s, and uh, I sure like the old Cardinal Stadium. And I'll tell you what, the Cardinal fans are second to none, I can tell you that. When you go to Lexington, it's almost like a, a funeral in their places there in football and stuff, so Go Cards. I have to warm you up that way. Uh, this is intimidating. I'm standing behind, or standing before trained educators who are teachers, who are taught how to teach. And now we got a bunch of administrators here. Principal, raise your hands. God love you all. Um, you scare me because, because you're trained to evaluate teachers. Here I am with the lesson plan for 40 minutes. I'm trying to impress you. Uh, all I have to say is respect your elders. You heard how long I've been in the profession. I'm still standing. So I want you to uh, be kind to me. Also, I'm very grateful today to uh, follow or to be before Malcolm Smith. I would hate to follow him. I've had him at our conferences for years. You're, you're in uh, store for a wonderful, wonderful event with Malcolm. I met Kevin. I think we're going to have some really good connections with Kevin uh, as far as the Center for School Safety is concerned. So it's a privilege to be here. And let me get into my lesson plan right away. My goal today was to give you a 30,000-foot view of bullying from my perspective as far as the Center for School Safety is concerned. So let's get at it. And Marty, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the culture and climate. Arnie Duncan, who was our uh, Secretary of Education, came up with this statement here. And I hope you can see my PowerPoint here. And those in the back, just trust me. Uh, that it says that you have to have that climate and culture that he was talking about. And basically, teachers can't teach and kids can't learn if they're afraid. And that's the bottom line. So anything that you can do, and I praise you all for doing this today, to have this type of summit together to get everybody under one roof, and let's go ahead. And I like the idea of the call to action type thing, and that's what Arnie Duncan says here, a call to action to be sure that every school is the safest school for those kids for all those reasons that Marty made comment about. Uh, one of your natives, uh, David Karam, when he was the chair of the State Board of Education, crafted this statement that the State Board bought into, and basically it calls for zero tolerance for bullying issues. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as my presentation gets going here a little bit further. But uh, zero tolerance, I'll say, on the front end of this thing does not mean you forego your common sense. It means you go after every single situation that comes before you and investigate it. But we'll get into that just a little bit more. Some data about bullying here. And some of this stuff I get from Malcolm Smith over here, so I'll give him credit for this. But uh, about 160,000 kids per day, and that's an average coming from the, uh, National, Associ the National Education Association, say that kids, 160,000 kids skip school each day because of something bad happening to them, probably a bullying situation. We in our state, back on the data we had from last year, had 13,626 cases of bullying that were reported. As you all know, they all don't get reported. But if I did my math right, I think we're looking at about almost five incidences of bullying occurring every minute in our state. It's a pretty tough stat to think about. Also, we have kids uh, in our country, uh, about 150,000 guesstimated, that uh, bring a gun to school each day. Not so much to have the targeted violence that we've seen about before, such as what happened in Benton but for protection because they can't deal with the people who are constantly bullying them. Some more information here. And this scares the heck out of me, folks. 70% of those arrested for hate crimes are under the age of 19. Now, I don't want to get real political up here, but at my age, I say a lot of things that I couldn't say when I was younger and I was afraid of being fired out of my job because I could retire yesterday. But it seems more recently, more kids feel more empowered to say nasty things to people. No matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're Hispanic, if you're gay, transgender, whatever it is, these kids are becoming targets of what I call hate kids who are saying these things to that. And we as 
principles, and that's my DNA. We as principals need to stand strong on this thing and not tolerate any of that talk at all. It's so bad when you see the TVs where New, New Zealand's a, a perfect case of this. You know what I'm talking about. We hate to see this happening. And so many of our kids are feeling bullied because of who they are and what they are, and they have a right to be in our school unfettered. Now, I served on a um, national committee on trying to come up with a definition of bullying, and this was very difficult. Um, so I'm going to give you the John Akersonian definition of bullying, and, and uh, Malcolm, you can debate this with me a little bit later on the pike here, but I'm saying that it's unwanted intentional. There's a word there that's not in our law in Kentucky. It's in John Akers' law here, which doesn't mean a whole lot. But unwanted intentional acts directed towards a person. That can happen, obviously, repeatedly. It doesn't necessarily have to be. And gets involved with that imbalance of power. Now, when you look at what we have here in Kentucky right now, and I don't know how you're dealing with it, because when you talk about those same things about bullying and the verbal, physical, social stuff like this, the word perceived comes into play, and it's very difficult for you to, you know, I guess, uh, what sort of want to say here, figure out, I think this person's bullying me. That's kind of in that gray area. And so they talk about that bullying should not happen on school campuses anywhere, on owner-sponsored events, and anything that disrupts the educational process. I didn't have to deal with that in my 25 years as a principal as far as that definition is concerned. This is what I deal with here. And if you can see it, I think it's great. There's a huge difference between peer conflict and bullying. Too many parents right now want to throw peer conflict into the bullying category because of the perception issues. And I have trouble with that. And so if you can't see this, this talks about how you can divide that out. And I won't read it to you. And they have my PowerPoint, and they can share it with you and use it. But um, this is also on our website. And so to me, uh, I think we need to educate parents a little bit more when it comes to the difference between these two things. I put this down under supplemental requirements. 158 talks about what you do as a principal. You're supposed to identify, document, and report any instances that come before you. You can only be wrong once. Always, always, always investigate every single incident that's reported to you. Do not let anything slide. And then, obviously, you have to investigate and respond to those complaints. And this is a tough one, retaliation issues. The bully sometimes wants to uh, get back at the victim, so to speak. And so it's your duty as a principal and staff members to make sure that you do your best to try to stop that. Some more information I'd like to add with you here. Uh, when I, and I, I need to take a, a quick aside and tell you that I was involved in, I have been involved with five bullying cases in our state as an expert witness. I will never be an expert witness for plaintiffs. I will always be an expert witness for school districts. And what I've learned in some of these cases that there are some things that principals did not do that they could have done that would have helped them a little bit more in their uh, cases that they had. One of them is making sure that that code, or if you will, the bullying policy, gets out to all the stakeholders. And that's a hard thing to do. You know, you have those code of conducts where the parents sign off on them. They think they're the parents signing off on them. I don't know if they actually read them, but that policy needs to be out there on your website. It needs to be drummed all the way through with your PTAs, et cetera. Saturate your environment with that. And provide information on the consequences for being caught as a bully. They need to know you're going to do something about it. And of course, that's a, that's a sticky wicket because if the kid's in special ed and it's not a part of his or her disability, you have a whole ball of wax that you've got to deal with. And FERPA comes into play here. So what efforts are schools making right now? I think you're doing a pretty good job. Can we do better? The answer is sure. You sure can do better than that. But it's not that we have forgotten about this thing over the years. It's not like it was 20, 30 years ago. It's more intense ever than before. And so make sure that your... Uh, School board policies are up to snuff. KSBA can help you with that to be sure. And of course, you can articulate that on over with your site-based councils as well. But getting that information out, and I'm gonna show you towards the end of my presentation here, I did a study 
on the principal's perceptions on how they deal with bullying issues. And I want to remind you on some of the issues about policies when we get to that. And also, having awareness training. That's what you're doing right now. That's something we can't do what I call a Calipari, a one and done thing. It's something, <laughs> I thought I'd work that in there. It's not a one and done thing, so remember that, keep the bullying, <laughs> I broke it, didn't I? All right, let's try it again. Um, it's not something that you just want to have on assembly and then we're done with it and we've done these things. We hunt up a few posters and stuff. It needs to be constantly a part of your fiber in this thing. Some more efforts that the schools are doing. Uh, yes, we have these assemblies, but we also need to look at these trainings that you're doing like you're doing today. Our shop has pushed out a lot of trainings over the years. In fact, we had a Malcolm at several of our conferences before with that. And KSA, KSA has some good webinars that they have for this that we have certainly endorsed as well. So, who owns this problem? This is not just a school problem. I think, and this is one of the things that I have a tough time with as a school administrator and a state person like this. They're parking so many things at our front doors of the schools each day and expect us to fix them. And I'm going to show you some math here in a minute that uh, will make my point, I think, quite clear. This is a lifelong issue. Bullying does not stop at graduation. I see it at the college level. I see it in my church, unfortunately. I see it out in society. So this is a societal problem that we have here. So zero tolerance, I talked about that earlier. We need to investigate every single incident that comes before you. One size does not fit all. I didn't model the one on the far right. But, uh, um, but one size doesn't fit all. You need to measure every single one of your incidences with the investigation information that you received, and you make the best call that you can do. So that's my point about zero tolerance. Investigate everything, but you don't do the same punishment for every kid. It's based on the uh, facts of the case. What's the extent of the bullying problem in our state? Well, it's the number one problem. Like I said a minute ago, five incidences occur every minute in our state. But here's a frustration that we have. 80% of the bullying that takes place that we investigate occur electronically. So you don't have the right, the reasonable suspicion to go to every single phone and start looking at those things. You have to have some kind of clue on that. And uh, oftentimes kids don't bully. They never bullied in front of me as a principal. So they're doing it behind our backs. So it's incredibly important to make sure that we find ways to get this to be reported to us. And so, uh, and, and this is a frustration thing too. We have assessed over 1,100 schools now with our six member team. And when we ask them questions, we are a lot different than the national standards when it comes to bullying issues. Some of our girls are nasty as can be. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod on that. Thank you for saying that. Many of them won't get into a fight, but boy, they will cut you off on social media. They will exclude you. Uh, in neighboring county, Bullock County, you may remember back in 2007, we had three girls that took their lives down there, all because of relational aggression with girls, uh, making, these young, making these young ladies feel terrible about themselves. And so it was a domino effect of three suicides there. Terrible thing. Um, and I make a comment here, it seems like a lot of the problems that are in our society are being parked at our front doors. Cyberbullying is huge. It's huge. And um, when we had a shooting down in Marshall, and I'll take an aside here real quick and tell you that uh, that could have happened in any county. Uh, Grant Lovett and Patricia Greer are two outstanding people. Fantastic superintendent, fantastic. To my first year principals, raise your hand. First year principals, raise your hand. Patricia Greer got a field promotion in October of the year that that shooting happened as a, she went from an assistant to a head principalship like that then had that shooting right there. But my point I'm going to make here is after that shooting that had occurred, we had 294 threats levied against our school where we had to shut down schools, get the SROs there, get them to investigate these things. And about 60 to 70% of those threats came in electronically. 
And uh, I have some curse words I like to use to parents about where are you when it comes to uh, looking at your kids' smartphones. Uh, the Attorney General's office has been very helpful for us over the years tracking down cyberbullying and cyber issues and cyber threats around the state. They can assist our uh, um, law enforcement officers to get an administrative subpoena and go to the social media security people and find out what the IP address is, and you can backtrack that and find out who's levying these threats and stuff like that. So uh, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, work on it. If any one of you all ever have to get into that, I'll be very happy to facilitate that for you through Andy Bashir's office and be able to help you out with that. But we need to see if we can step on these things a little bit more. So I go back to whose problem is this again. I say bullying is everyone's problem, and I want to keep that. And you'll hear that theme from me. I don't want to, ex you know, to assume all of the responsibility in our schools that bullying is our problem, okay? Um, I apologize for how uh, many words I have on this. You're not supposed to have that many words on a PowerPoint slide. But I, I use that phrase about it takes a village. Yes, I want to see or not school officials address this. I want to see the private sector uh, address this. I'll see parents. I want to see ministers step up to the plate and talk about how to not bully in their churches and things like that. I want governmental agencies. I want chamber of commerce. I want everybody to take ownership of what's going on in their community. So let's do the math. And I hope we have some people in the media here who will have the guts to quote me on this. I have given this uh, quote out, I can't tell you how many times, ad nauseum, and nobody will produce or reproduce it for me. When I do the math, we have, and for you math teachers, if I screw it up, raise your hand and I'll correct it. But you have 24 hours in a day, and you got 365 days a year. So that's 8,000 and some change. Now, I say the average school day is about a seven-hour day times 180 days were there, so that's roughly 1,260 days, hours, excuse me. So when you do the math, we have 7,500 hours out there that we don't have kids. That constitutes about 15% of the time we have the kids. Somebody else has got them 85% of the time. Where are the role models? Where are the monitoring things going on with these kids? Oh, do you just encourage me? I'm going to get one out. When I first, first started teaching, yes, 1970, proud of it, I could threaten the kids with their parents. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to call mom. And you know you're going to have hell to pay when you get home, don't you? Because you'll get twice as much there, as they say theoretically, than what you get at school. Then I would have kids say, well, give me a whooping. I don't want my parents to know about that. When I left Dunbar High School back in 1999 and I was bringing a kid up for dropping an F-bomb in class that I saw, whipped out his cell phone on the way to the office and told mom to get up here. Akers is going to try to tell you that I was cursing. Times have changed a lot, folks. Not all parents are that way. I grant you that. But we have too many parents right now that aren't taking on the responsibility of being a parent. They want to be a, bit, a best friend. And that's not the way to handle things, in my opinion. So let's get into some prevention ideas that I've seen across the state that might help you out a little bit. And this might be redundant a little bit. Sometimes repetition's not really bad for the soul. So I go back and repeat again. And, and we, we have principals around our state still who will say, well, that doesn't seem like a case that I want to investigate. Okay, investigate every single case that is brought to you. Please do that. Take the appropriate administrative action when necessary and have some kind of prevention plan documented in your school. It could be the Oveas program, which costs some money, and our KDE folks will help you with that a little bit as far as the, train the trainers are concerned. On our website, we have Peter Yarrow's group, Operation Respect, it's absolutely free. Uh, but you know, a bullying prevention program is solely dependent upon your teachers to make it work in the classrooms. And so, like Marty was saying a few minutes ago, we get to that call to action thing, you guys are the makers and shakers, and you got to sell this when you get back into your schools. And so have some kind of prevention program will really help you out. The times that principals got dinged in these cases I was talking about is when they didn't investigate every single report, that they didn't take the appropriate administrative action, and they didn't have any kind of identified program on the books. Okay, so let's move a little further here. 
uh, with your new teachers when they come in, you need to sit down with them and give them strong uh, information about what you feel about bullying in your uh, school and how you expect them to respond. And not just your teachers, but your classified staff as well. Uh, those people sometimes get to be the invisible people, the custodians, the cafeteria ladies and stuff like that. And they can be just as effective as any teacher you have in your, you know, on your staff. Conduct update trainings with your staff each year and document that you've done that. Oh no, we did it two or three years ago. We did the Calipari thing two or three years ago. Don't have to do that thing now. Do it every year. Do it along when you do your uh, updates with your uh, emergency operating planning. When reports are filed, many of the kids we find out and the parents we find out don't understand the steps you're gonna go through to investigate these cases. So you need to tell them when something comes to you, here's what we're gonna do. Um, give students explicit instructions on how to report these things. Uh, when we do our, our uh, safe school assessments, we ask the kids if you're bullied uh, or if you have, you're being sexually harassed or whatever the case may be, do you know how to report this? Well, we find out now kids don't want to go face to face with staff members because, you know, they'll look like the narc type thing. They won't sometimes even call on a telephone because you'll be able to recognize my voice. So now we're moving towards electronic texting, emailing, and things like this when kids can come in a little bit more anonymously, if you will. Uh, I was talking about tip lines around the state. And I'll take a quick aside here and tell you a couple of things. Uh, Senate Bill 1 is a good thing. I'm going to make sure that when the school safety marshal comes your way that it's a school person that knows how to talk school. So I have a lot more I'll talk about that at a later time. I know that's got some consternation going around in the state. But one of the things that I was able to work with, Homeland Security here in our state has the capability of doing email, texting, and phone messaging. And so we're going to start working with Homeland Security to have a statewide tip line, which is a multi-level tip line that will eventually be able to come in here and superintendents will no longer have to be paying subscription costs to have your own tip lines and things like that. Um, a quick commercial for me right here. This is our tip line. We're into, I think, right at around uh, 700 schools in our state right now in about 100 counties, whatever. And it's not mandatory, but it's a free service that we offer as well. My point is, let kids know that there are multiple ways to get this information to you all. I say advertise, advertise, advertise. One of the schools that were um, involved in the uh, um, lawsuit that I was talking about, they didn't have one poster or one something on the wall that gave the person walking down the hallway an indication that that is a bullying-free environment. So yes, they're looking for, you know, what messages do you have out there that will read your building well, so to speak. Community help. Local businesses have a long history of helping us. I would like to see, if I said, uh, table tents, would you know what I'm talking about? When you go to a restaurant, they have those little table tents there. I would challenge the chambers of commerce to get all their policies and, and uh, uh, get the restaurants to put down. We don't tolerate bullying around here. If you see something, say something. Tell the parents that move that message all over the place. Um, I already mentioned the chamber of commerce things here. Engage the community groups to let them know that you're going to do the best you can with the 15% of the time that you got. What are they going to do with the 85% when they have the kids there? Uh, publish the uh, responsibilities that make sure that parents understand that 80% of this bullying is taking place as far as our state is concerned, 80% uh, electronically. And they owe it to us to be getting onto those uh, uh, cell phones and talk about that. And I, I think I bored you all the principal types back in July with the story about the lady down in Nelson County that when I made that comment, she said her uh, daughter, eighth grade girl, was a Christian girl, and she didn't engage in anything bad like that, and so she wasn't going to look at her cell phone. And I challenged the mom to look at that one time. She took me up on my challenge and had the phone charged in her bedroom last the night, that night. It buzzed all night long. Eighth grade girls texting two and three and four o'clock in the morning, and some of the messaging the mom told me was very inappropriate for those girls at that age. Now, I'm not saying she was a bad girl, but mom learned something that day. And so statistics show that only two to three percent of the parents monitor what their kids do online. We need to educate the parents saying, step up the plate and help us, help you. 
So school officials rely solely on somebody reporting it to us. We can't see it electronically. And like I said, more often than not, kids don't bully physically in front of us. So we have to get that reporting mechanism really help us out. Um, and I just made that comment here. I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, the bottom line here is that we, don't, we cannot address what we cannot see. So there you go. Bullying, again, is that community problem. Um, they should invade, you know, invest in the neighborhood watch thing. How many times have we seen kids video fights out in the community? And we've seen video in the schools as well. So we're telling, let's get these neighborhood groups together here. Again, my point of pushing out this thing is it's a community issue. One other thing here too, I just mentioned they need to monitor and know uh, where their kids are on social media and they need to find out, and we've got this published on our website, how kids hide icons on their uh, cell phones behind the calculator, behind whatever, and you got Snapchat and you've got Instagram, et cetera, being concealed there. Um, we need to get information out to the parents on how to prevent and intervene on some of these things. PSA campaigns. This is public service announcements. Lafayette High School did a really good job when they rolled out their um, uh, tip line information like that. They did a video presentation that I think was really good. We have uh, PSAs on our uh, uh, website on anti-bullying issues and things like that that are absolutely free. And for those of you who have uh, television classes and stuff like that, kids really like to watch what other kids produce. And so see if you can't get your groups to start thinking about what kind of bullying, mes bullying prevention messages they can get out there to help out a little bit. And again, I, to our friends in the media, there's a lot of free time that you can get on your radio and your televisions, and they can push out information as well about bullying issues. My point is, is again, it's ad nauseum, I realize that. It's a community problem, and they need to help step up to the plate that 85% of the time. Document any efforts that you make to try to prevent bullying. Because when you go to a court of law, they're going to ask you, do you have your posters? Did you publish these things? Did you have your conference, or did you have your meetings with your classified, your certified staff? Uh, did, did, did you publish these things? Um, uh, what efforts have you made uh, in mid-year? What efforts did you make towards the end of the year? You have to be able to document those things. Publicize these things for your PTA newsletters, your, your TV you know, stations that you have that will help you with that. Also, again, we need to work together as the community. Here's our web page here, and what you'll see on that is a whole section that deals with bullying. It's very long and involved. It's a good shopping mall for you to look at some things that uh, you may need. And if you want something special, let me know. I've got a whole team down at Murray State University that will do research for us and get that information for you. Now, here's the part that I wanted to talk with you about. I was trying to get to it pretty quickly here. How am I doing on time? I'm OK, good. All right. You all know how to read data and charts and stuff, and you're all going to have to squint from back there. So I'm going to kind of interpret for you a little bit. When I did my research on what principal's thoughts were about bullying prevention around this country, I only found two researches out there, or two research projects out there. One dealt with a state law that had changed, another one dealt with kids who were uh, gay and how they were being bullied. But I wanted to know the principal's perspectives. Now, we've heard the parents' perspectives. They think that we're not doing a good job in, in trying to address bullying issues around our state. So I sent this out to our state, had 800 principal plus respond to this survey. So the first question I asked was, I'm going to put on my reading glasses so I can see this a little bit better, so I can quote, you know, quote it for you guys in the back there. Has your local uh, school board passed a bullying policy? And all respondents, and they, I have elementary, middle, and high there, so you can see the charts there. 90 plus percent of the counties have a bullying prevention program or a bullying policy there. Do your school board members attempt to intercede on behalf of parents whose child has been a victim of bullying? Now, I don't want to get real political here, but the last time I studied my school law, school board members legislate policy. They're not supposed to execute policy. So what we find out statewide here that probably 30% of our board members are intervening on bullying issues. And so, that's an issue that you have to deal with statewide. 
uh, and I've told the KSBA people, back off and let the principals and superintendents do their job. Um, how well does the bullying policy in your school reduce bullying behaviors? It's kind of a mixed bag, but as you look at that chart there, about 70% say it's working pretty well. It's not perfect. Uh, the speeding laws here, I, I've been to traffic school five times. I'm working on my terminal degree on speed. <laughs> and so though there's a law out there, John Eager still hits 80 miles an hour down I-64. Uh, just because you have a bullying policy doesn't mean it stops. Now when I see guys with a little blue lights, I slow down. You're in the blue lights in the hall with looking at these kids on them back off. Have you received bullying training? Uh, bullying prevention training, I should say. And we have about 30%, um, 35% of the state principals have never been trained in how to deal with bullying training, uh, bullying prevention training. If they don't know what's going on, their staff not going to know what's going on. Oh, okay, I hit the wrong button there. Here's a big one right here. Are most parents satisfied with the reporting process? And yeah, we're up in the high 80s on that. Okay. Our parents informed of the difference between bullying and peer conflict. And this is a mixed bag right here. We're looking at about 40% of the parents do not know the difference between peer conflict and bullying. That's where we as edu uh, educators need to educate them as what the differences are. Use that chart that I was talking about a few minutes ago. The parents of the victim understand FERPA laws. Why we can't tell the parent what we did to the bully. And you're seeing a large percentage of those that uh, relative 60% of the parents have no idea what FERP is all about when it comes to what you can and what you cannot say. Are the parents the victim of bullying usually satisfied? Now here's a real interesting one that I found out. Are the parents of the victim usually satisfied with your investigation and subsequent administrative uh, decision? 90% of the parents are satisfied with what you've done. I think that's a good thing. Sometimes I think when we read what goes on in the newspaper, sometimes there's a different spin on it. This is what the principals are telling me. Do you usually receive support from the bullies, parents? Yes, in the high 70s. I think that's tremendous that we're seeing a lot of that there. We have a lot to celebrate. And again, I go back to the point we're not perfect. We have to keep things going and make it better. What's your greatest frustration, Miss and Mr. Principal, about bullying in the schools? And I know you can't see this already. To you. The, the uh, yellow chart says parents and guardians not realizing that bullying issues can occur anywhere at any place at the time. Then the blue one talks about parent and guardians labeling peer conflict as bullying. Then the green one right there is electronic cyber bullying issues where we don't know what's actually occurring. And then the uh, black chart there talks about bullying events not being reported by students or parents. But what about the flip side of this thing? What's your greatest reward in dealing with bullying incidents in your school? And the one that gets 80% plus on this thing is you, the principal, observing that the change in behavior has occurred. Uh, so that kind of is the biggie thing right there. So kind of wrapping this thing up, what do, what do these charts tell us about teachers, about principals, and about our superintendents? From my perspective, this is what it says to us. You protect your students. You do a good job at it. Again, are we perfect? The answer is no, but we're sure batting above 500 on this thing. So please remember this. Ad nauseum again, bullying is everyone's problem. We're all in this together, and I'm talking about the 85 percenters out there, and it's going to take that village to really, really help us in our schools try to make some major changes with these issues that happen in our schools. Uh, I won't ask for questions or comments here because I know you're going to be setting up for your panel here and things like this. Uh, here's my contact information if you can see this. I certainly uh, invite you to uh, uh, contact me if you have anything you would like for us to from the Center for School State to help you with. Uh, my office is, is really in my car, so my cell phone is the best way to get in contact with me. But uh, our website's there right here. If you need anything from the Kentucky Center for School State, we'll be very happy to uh, accommodate you. Again, it's been a privilege to be able to speak with you today about the kind of 30,000 foot view from my perspective of what's going on bullying here. Just know that we at the Center for School Safety stand ready to help you 
anytime, any place. Thank you so much. Okay, this is a good time to go ahead and take a quick bathroom break, make a break where you can call your schools and check in for just a few moments. When we come back, we're going to hear a message from our Assistant Superintendent for Culture and Climate, Dr. Katie DeFerrari, and then we will begin our panel discussion. So let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back here in just a few moments. Thank you. Oh, it's one of those. No, no. Perfect. Look at that. Oops. Oops. And if you want this right underneath here. No. 
about getting in the power skip for some reason. Uh, oh. Oh. There we go.